from New York to our Bloomberg television and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start once again today with the markets, which are trying to get a little direction, a little risk off, but Abigail Doolittle is really going to explain it to us. It doesn't, they're going a little bit, but that doesn't feel like they're very convinced at the moment, Abigail. I would agree with you on that, David. Right now, we are looking at somewhat of a neutral risk appetite. In the pre-market, it was really risk off. We had the stock futures down. We had bonds higher. At this point, we have mixed action. The NASDAQ is actually trading higher. The S&P 500 and the Dow a little bit lower, helping out the NASDAQ, of course, some of those big FANG uh, stocks declining or weighing, I should say, in the S&P 500 and the Dow, the financials. And this could be worrisome, David, down about 1.8% right now, even though you have bonds lower, which tells you yields are higher. Typically, higher yields would help financials. Uh, financials, of course, more than 10% of the S&P 500. So over the last couple of weeks, it's really been a tug of war between the bears and the bulls, and tech has been leading the way, but you need to see some of these other key sectors uh, stepping it up as well. Well, Abigail, that's what I'm interested in this week, frankly, is the U.S. Treasury issuance, because they're going to have to borrow a lot more money. What do we think that's going to do to the bond market, the Treasury market? Well, today it's not having much of an effect. We're seeing a little bit of a sell-off. Last week there was a big sell-off on the idea that there's going to be all of this supply. Will there be as much demand? On the corporate side, there's also uh, there's been a ton of issuance. Uh, it seems as though the markets right now are absorbing that supply. Let's see whether or not that continues. Certainly helping today, though, David, one sector that's doing quite well, uh, the healthcare sector outperforming, especially biotech. And Cardinal Health, David, they put up a very good quarter, and that has a lot to do, apparently, the drug distributor, healthcare uh, distributor, uh, the fact uh, that they saw their sales boosted by COVID-19. And then you and I have been talking about that Gilead virus drug, apparently uh, in some short supply. It's still a little bit of a head scratcher on that one though, David, since it simply uh, lessens the time who somebody who, if they're severely sick with COVID, unfortunately lessens that time, but it's really not a game changer for the economy, but a little bit of a popping there. But we, this week we'll certainly be watching uh, that debt issuance because that could help to break the tug of war that we've been seeing between the bulls and the bears, David. Abigail, thank you so very much. It's Abigail Doolittle with a report on the markets. Well, the White House continues to urge the economy to open back up, even as parts of the White House are closing up because people are testing positive for COVID-19 or they've been around people who've tested positive. We welcome now Josh Wingrove, who covers the White House for Bloomberg. So the White House seems to be caught a little bit off guard here, where they're actually, even the Vice President Pence said he had to stay away from people for a bit. Yeah, it sounds like he self-isolated over the weekend. He's back at the White House today, but his schedule doesn't show him uh, going to the same events with President Trump, who has an event at 4 p.m. So I think we'll be watching that to see, does the vice president show up or not? Of course, the two of them haven't been avoiding being in the same room, but if we are, that might be a sign of the severity. But over the past few days, we've seen sort of mounting cases or potential cases throughout the administration. That includes, of course, the vice president's press secretary, also two members of the Joint Chief of Staff who've either been exposed to cases or have had both a positive and a negative test in one case. Uh, and so they're stepping away, as well as three top health officials who are self-isolating after contact with an official, we think probably that same press secretary. And that includes the head of the FDA, the head of the CDC, and Dr. Fauci, who, of course, has been a high-profile figure. So, you know, lots of cases here. And now the president himself, uh, uh, excuse me, lots of cases of, of self-isolation, not necessarily cases of the virus. And now the president is going to do daily testing, which, of course, uh, has its own significance. Well, it has significance also for people across the country. As we talk about coming back to work, back into our normal lives, we don't have the capacity for daily testing. At the White House, they're doing daily testing. Does that indicate something about how short we are, perhaps, on getting ready to come back if we can't test all of us more regularly? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things the White House has been doing is pointing to other countries that they see as success stories. We sort of looked into that, and they are cautionary tales at best. Those countries include Austria, South Korea, in Singapore, you know, in the case of Austria and South Korea, they moved much more quickly than the U.S. did. Singapore was a success story, now has a second wave. Austria had one emerge this weekend from nightclubs, believe it or not, which are still allowed out there. So all the places the U.S. is pointing to uh, are reopening more cautiously, have far, far lower caseloads. We're talking, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 cases a day as opposed to 20-something thousand in the U.S. Uh, new cases. Uh, and are potentially seeing second waves. So that is a signal, of course, that the U.S. could be going down the same path. We could continue to see these renewed outbreaks. And as you say, we simply 
don't have enough right. testing for the public at large. But of course, the White House is relying very heavily on it, in particular for their own staff and the president himself. In the meantime, Josh, there's also some activity, at least, up on Capitol Hill. I'm not sure what they're doing exactly. Because we know that the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is putting together another spending package, even as Republicans say, let's go slow on this. Why does the White House, why do, why does, why do the Republicans want to go slow if they think they have to do the assistance sooner or later? Yeah, it, it's a great question. That's a, you know, I've uh, been making some calls on that today, in fact. Uh, there is pushback from conservative circles that we are spending too much money, that the president needs to not do a phase four at all, let alone engage in horse trading to give Pelosi what she wants and the Republicans get what they want. So the president has pumped the brakes on it. There was a story over the weekend in the Washington Post that officials, including his new chief of staff, Mark Meadows, are, are turning into sort of deficit hawks, uh, for lack of a better phrase, and don't think that we should at least be rushing to put more money out the door. So it is, it is, there are increasing signs that the president is under pressure from Republican circles not only to pull back from a phase four, but potentially not to do one at all. So we're going to see a wish list from the Democrats and where the president takes it, where Republicans take it, I think is still very much up in the air. Okay, Josh, thank you so much for the reporting. That's Josh Wingrove, who covers the White House for Bloomberg. Coming up here on Balance of Power, we're going to talk with Lani Chen of the Hoover Institution. He has a plan for how we might be able to open colleges and universities across the country come September. We're going to ask him what that plan is. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is time now for First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. New York City's lockdown is likely to continue into June. The state's been under lockdown since March in an attempt to stop the spread of the coronavirus. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has said that some regions of the state will be able to reopening, reopen rather, beginning May 15th, but that likely will not include hard-hit New York City. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has unveiled his plans to reopen the country. He told the House of Commons today that restrictions will ease in phases. The first steps will take effect this Wednesday. They include a return to work for those who can't work from home. But he warned the UK is not out of the woods. We have begun our descent from the peak of the epidemic, but our journey has reached the most uh, perilous moment where a wrong move could be disastrous. So, at this stage, we can go no further than to announce the first careful modification of our measures. Prime Minister Johnson's plan also calls for people to wear face coverings in enclosed spaces, and he urged Britons to prepare for the new normal to last a year or more. One sign that Europe's economies are beginning to revive, drivers have started to clog up the roads again. Statistics show traffic jams on Germany's highways doubled last weekend from a week earlier. Congestion in Madrid and London is also on the rise. Nations are slowly lifting restrictions that have been in place since March. Officials say they think many citizens use the weekend to visit family they haven't seen in months. Iran reported 45 deaths from the coronavirus in the past 24 hours. The total number of fatalities in Iran is now more than 6,600. Iran also saw nearly 1,700 new cases overnight. The spike comes as a lockdown was reimposed in large areas of the country last week. Health officials in Iran say the rate of new infections is alarmingly high in the capital, Tehran. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, it's not just businesses who are trying to get back to business. It's also our colleges and universities who face a really uncertain fall coming up here, whether they can really have their students come back. Lonnie Chen is a resident fellow at the Hoover Institution and also former chief policy advisor to Mitt Romney when he ran for president. Well, he has a plan now for getting the colleges and universities maybe back up and running in the fall. And he's, we welcome him now. He can take us through his plan. Lonnie, thanks so much for being with us. So you have a pretty specific plan about what's to be done here. First of all, why is it so important that they do get back up and running? 
Well, David, I think there, there's a few things. First of all, the the college experience, the essence of the American higher education experience requires these in-person interactions. It requires uh, students to be able to interact with faculty in the classroom, students to be able to interact with one another. Uh, the essence of the college experience really depends on it. So th there is that, but also we've been engaging in online education in the collegiate context now for several months here at Stanford, as an example. Uh, we, we concluded our winter quarter online. Our spring quarter has been entirely online. And what we've experienced from that is that some students simply aren't able to share in the experience in the same way because uh, they come from socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, where technology can be more challenging. It can be harder to find quiet spaces. And so for all of these reasons, whether it's because of the essence of the experience or because of the, the need to promote equity in that experience, uh, a return of students to college campuses this fall, we believe, is an imperative. So the first thing you put in your plan is basically testing, which is what we're talking about across the entire country now, really to regularly test both students and faculty members and staff as well. Do we have the capability of doing that right now, and how often would we need to do the testing? Well, certainly we would need to make sure that students are tested before they come back to campus or shortly after their arrival back on campus. And then we anticipate some kind of regular testing regime, and the science is going to have to guide us in terms of what's necessary for that, but it's going to have to be fairly frequent. And we're going to have to couple that with contact tracing, which on college campuses can be a little bit easier because you've got a discrete population. In many cases, colleges and universities already have in place either email or SMS notifications that allow them to inform students of various things that are happening on campus. So if you combine testing with contact tracing, that's a good way of determining what kind of prevalence of COVID-19 you have in your population, but also begin to attend to potential hotspots and outbreaks on campus. Now, in terms of the testing capacity, as we ramp up moving toward the fall, we're hopeful that by the time we get to August and September, we'll have enough testing capacity available that at least in many college campuses, we'll be able to get a good sense of what's going on. Uh, one of the things that's difficult is social distancing uh, with young people on campuses, particularly with dormitories and things. Is there enough room? Can you really keep the distance you need in a dormitory? Do they need to build more dormitories or use other buildings? Well, certainly colleges and universities are going to have to figure out what space they can expand into on their existing footprints. That's going to be tough, though to really create the social distance that you need. Also, it's going to be tough because students are going to be interacting with one another in social and academic settings. So a, a couple of things are probably going to have, to have to happen. First of all, you're going to have to have maybe staggered returns where not all students are coming back all at once, where certain students, maybe those who are higher risk, decide to remain off campus. You're going to have to leverage local community assets potentially to, uh, to expand housing capacity. But, but it is quite clear that college as we knew it, where everyone was on campus all at the same time, that may not be possible. But you have to also put in place monitoring at buildings, college uh, buildings. When people are going into those buildings, you might want to do things like temperature checks and tracing in that way as well. So you're going to have to combine many different factors, including actual distance with some of the existing things that we've been doing, hand hygiene uh, ensuring that there's space coverings, things like that. And, and you got to do the best you can to bring as many people back as you can at once. Lenny, it strikes me that a lot of the things you're talking about for colleges and universities apply as well in the workplace. Uh, are we prepared as a country for all of our employers to implement the sorts of things you're talking about for colleges? Well, I, you know, I think employers are going to have to play a bigger role, David, in, in our recovery in terms of understanding, first of all, what's happening with their workforces and what they can do to keep those workforces healthy. So some of the things that we discuss in our plan for colleges and universities, things like uh, face coverings, hygiene, promoting distance where possible, uh, temperature checks, things like that uh, are probably going to become part and parcel of the American workplace. And I do think that work, workplaces and employers are prepared to step up to take that bigger role. Uh, I think the much larger question is just going to be confidence. You know, how confident are people going to be that they can step back into those workplaces, step back on college campuses, uh, kind of move back toward normality, if you will? How confident are they that they can do that and remain physically safe? And I think that's going to be a question and concern that ultimately we're not going to have a great handle on until we begin 
uh, coming back in and gradually reopening the economy and seeing what happens. You know, if we have a good experience and people are begin to come back into workplaces and it looks like things are relatively under control, I think that will promote greater confidence. The challenge will be if we do reopen and we don't get the speed quite right and we end up with, let's say, more cases than we want in some parts of the country, that could inhibit the comeback. But in my mind, employers are going to have to work cooperatively with government, local, state, and federal, to get this economy reopened in a responsible way. Well, as you suggest, sounds exactly right. It's not just that we have to keep you safer. We have to make you believe we're keeping you safer. And, Lonnie, it strikes me that's clearly a personal safety issue. It's also an economic issue because so much of our economy is driven by the consumer. And if the consumer is not willing to get back out in the marketplace and interact, we're going to have a longer-term problem to an already really critical crisis in, in the economy. Well, that's right, because the, the economic recovery is certainly tied to, to just how people are feeling. You know, I mean, we can talk, for example, about uh, going out to restaurants or to get essential services done, but it's going to be very difficult and challenging for that to happen on any kind of scale until people have a, a certain level of psychic or psychological comfort that the, the right steps are in place to protect their personal public health. And I would suggest, David, this is going to vary significantly across the country. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. We make this point in our piece about colleges and universities. We make the same point about what's happening in our economic recovery nationally, that there is no one-size-fits-all prescription, whether you're talking about California, Texas, different states, different parts of the country, but also even within states. You look at the differences between urban areas like L.A. and San Francisco uh, or, or in New York State, you can see those differences as well. So we're going to really have to tailor uh, policy interventions and solutions effectively and smartly by looking at some of these differences from local to local area. Uh, and Lonnie, apply this, if you will, to a presidential election. In this very specific regard, we're going to need you to feel safe going to a polling place come November as well. Does this mean that it's more and more likely we're going to have more remote voting, that is to say absentee ballots and the like? Well, you know, California just made the decision, for example, to shift to pretty much an all-mail election this November. Some other states like Oregon and Washington have had good mail-in infrastructure available for some time. And in some states, that will be the right answer to expand access to, uh, to absentee forms of voting. The challenge is going to be, you know, there are a lot of states where there is absolutely no infrastructure for mail-in balloting or remote balloting. And in those states, it is going to be a challenge for us to stand that up in an effective way in the few months between now and November. So states are going to have to do what they can when there is in-person balloting to promote some of these basic principles we've talked about, like social distancing, like good hygiene. Those are going to have to be tenets of, uh, of a responsible way for people to exercise their right to vote, because we have to be able to maintain the integrity of the system and the answer is not always going to be, let's move everything to a remote setting, because quite frankly, for some states, uh, that kind of infrastructure setup just will not be possible. But preserving the integrity of our vote as we move toward November should be a public policy priority for many jurisdictions. Certainly have to protect the integrity of the vote. As far as you can tell, Lonnie, is there any r right, left, Republican, Democrat skew to the concern about the safety of our balloting? Well, I think both Republicans and Democrats agree that we need to preserve the, the safety of, of, of the system, the integrity of the system. I think there are disagreements, though, about the best way to do that. I think Republicans have been skeptical of widespread expansion of mail-in voting, for example, for some of the reasons I, I indicated. The infrastructure challenges, also concerns about fraud, which a bipartisan election commission back in the mid-2000s found that mail-in balloting was was slightly more, more susceptible to that. So we just have to figure out ways to ensure that the system is safe and secure going forward. I think that's a bipartisan goal that hopefully both parties will share going forward. Okay, Lonnie, I really appreciate your being with us. Always do. That's Lonnie Chen. He is from the Hoover Institution. And coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to talk with Representative, Republican Representative Patrick McHenry of North Carolina about those plans that at least uh, Speaker of the House Pelosi has to have a new spending bill. That's coming up. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our stock of the hour is AMC. Its stock has jumped today on rumors that maybe, maybe Amazon might be interested in buying it. And here to explain why, we have Abigail Doolittle. So Abigail, explain to me why. I understand it's cheap, AMC's cheap, but some people would think it's cheap for a reason. Why would Amazon want it? That's a great point or a great question, uh, David, because it's pretty clear why AMC would want out considering that their stock is down so much recently. As for why Amazon would be interested uh, in AMC, that probably has more to do with their uh, Amazon uh, online, their streaming business, and the fact that they last year made the choice when they have a big movie release uh, to bring it right in-house. So a lot of outside venues, similar to Netflix with the Paris Theater last year, not as open to them. So they want a venue perhaps for some of those uh, big names. But relative to AMC, gosh, what a difficult time for them. Uh, movie sales really right down, sliding down on the lockdown and the shutdown. The stock on the day, David, really pretty incredible. Casino-like, in fact. You have AMC at the highs up 56%. Of course, it is a, a penny stock to your point, very uh, cheap. Uh, now up 38%. The UK Mail saying that they are in talks. However, Deadline.com, David, saying, uh, but not so fast. It may not be true. So there may be more coming on this story. Well, that's my question, really. How much how much credit do we put in it really in this rumor? And by the way, is there anybody else that might want to buy it as well? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Possibly Netflix, because again, last year, uh, that purchase of the Paris Theater to showcase some of their movies that could, in fact, be uh, Oscar worthy or award show worthy. So that might be a, com a competitor relative to price on AMC trading right now around six hundred billion dollars. That would be on the sol smaller side, at least for net or excuse me, Amazon and Amazon over time, David, they really really have not grown through acquisition. They've been more of an organic sales story, but relative to the acquisitions, probably the best well-known one, uh, Whole Foods at $13.6 billion. A number of years ago, they made one that was about $500 billion. Uh, Quidizzi, I don't know if I'm quite saying that right, that turned into diapers.com. They've actually closed that business down, but that's half a billion. Uh, so that would be along the lines of what AMC would be. One analyst, David, saying that Amazon would be interested in paying cash. AMC might not actually want that. They might want something relative uh, to share. So lots of nuances here, something to uh, pay attention to going forward. But again, today, lots of uh, very interesting trading action there for AMC, absolutely soaring on the day, David. Yeah, I'm sure AMC is hoping there's something to the story. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on, on AMC. Coming up here, we're going to talk with Representative Patrick, McCart uh, Patrick McHenry of North Carolina. He's the ranking Republican on the House Financial Services Committee. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We go now to Bloomberg First Word News with Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her fellow Democrats are expected to complete the next coronavirus stimulus package this week. It's likely to contain more than $700 billion for state and local governments. But the White House and Senate Republicans are not in a rush after spending more than $3 trillion so far. They're putting an emphasis on other priorities. One of those is shielding businesses from liability if their employees get sick. The Chinese city where the coronavirus pandemic started has reported its first new infections since April 8th. That's when Wuhan ended its 76-day lockdown. The new cases were found in people already under quarantine. China has been slowly reopening its economy. Encouraging news from Spain, the country recorded its lowest daily coronavirus death toll in almost two months. Spain has moved into the latest phase of a gradual easing of its lockdown rules. The country has had more than 227,000 cases, the highest in Europe. More than 26,000 people have died. India is considering allowing some domestic flights to resume this week, or next week, excuse me. The government is looking to reopen a key part of the economy. Airlines haven't been allowed to fly since March because of a nationwide lockdown. Bloomberg has learned a decision could come today. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. 
Thanks so much, Mark. As Mark just said, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, is working hard with her Democratic colleagues to put together another spending package. But it's not all that clear at the moment when that's going to go forward or even whether it's going to go forward. We welcome now Re Representative Patrick McKendry. He's the ranking member on the House Financial Services Committee in the House of Representatives. He is a Republican. So welcome, Congressman. Good to have you with us. Let me ask you perhaps the most basic question. Do you believe that there will be some fourth round, as it's called, is this a matter of whether or is it a matter of when? I think it's a question of when and to what extent. What we don't understand right now is the magnitude of the economic pain. We have current statistics, uh, but we don't know what this looks like as states, uh, state by state, uh, uh, reemergence into the normal economy, how that develops. Uh, Tennessee and Georgia, we see examples there, but uh, it seems slow that uh, people are getting back to normal economic life out of health safety. And so what I, what I am counseling is that we, uh, you know, measure twice and cut once. If we're going to legislate again, let's make sure that we're hitting those and helping those uh, that need the most assistance and doing the right thing for the long term of our country. There's the question of how the overall economy is going. As you suggest, Congressman, it may well vary, will vary probably from state to state. But isn't there a pretty broad agreement that the states themselves, the state and local governments are really getting hit? We have both Republican and Democratic governors coming forward saying we're really getting hit, both on increased costs and on reduced revenues. Should we be doing something about that in the meantime? Well, yes. And I, I think you'll have some level of state aid be a part of the next package. It's a question of what you get in return for, for doing this. Do you say to the states you have to be fiscally responsible on a going forward basis, have to have a rainy day fund on a going forward basis? Many of these states uh, were in poor financial conditions before this happened. And we don't want to just prop up profligate spending at the state level. We want to be effective to ensure that states uh, don't have to uh, declare bankruptcy. And so I think there is some level of consensus around that for the next package. Uh, but we're not pressed right now. I think we have uh, two to three months before that becomes a pressing issue. So does that suggest that perhaps this could wait two or three months, that maybe we shouldn't expect anything until in, well into the summer? Yeah, I, I think we're looking at June or July before you have the next round of package, uh, of spending package come out of Congress. I think that would be the responsible thing. I'll give you one example, the university systems. Do we know if the universities are, and colleges are going to go back in the fall? We know if uh, they don't have students in the dorms, you have a massive physical plant uh, for every one of these uh, universities. Uh, are, you going to have, um, are you going to have states impacted based off of uh, their university systems not having students on campus? And to what extent? So let's make sure that we understand the issues that, that are affecting people before we try to seek to fix them. Currently, we still have additional funds to probably the tune of over a trillion dollars that's yet to be actually put out into the market uh, from the last CARES Act. So let's make sure that those dollars are effective before we spend again. Uh, that's about the next round, the so-called fourth round. Let's talk about the rounds that have come so far. You were a very active proponent of the payroll protection program, particularly for smaller businesses. We now have an inspector general report suggesting that maybe that money, a lot of it, didn't go where Congress really intended and went to somewhat larger companies, not the smaller ones. Are you concerned about that issue? Sure. I, I'm always concerned about uh, the taxpayer dollar being spent effectively and in compliance with the law. What we see here, what the inspector general highlighted, is that they largely did that. And when you're putting out uh, three to four hundred billion dollars in a period of four weeks, uh, there are going to be uh, mistakes made. And there were mistakes made with this program, but it was still largely effective. There's, uh, there are thousands of small businesses that are around today because of this assistance. And you have tens of thousands of, of employees that are able to collect a paycheck because of the Paycheck Protection Program. So it was still largely effective, though there were some failures. Uh, Congressman, whether it's round one, two, three, or a possible four, 
how are we going to pay for this? We're talking about something like, I think, $4 trillion in deficit at this point. That money has to come from somewhere, or does it? It does. It, it eventually, uh, it, the, it, it comes home to roost. Um, and on this, uh, I think we have to be methodical about this ne next spending package because over the long term, uh, we are going to have to pay this money back. Uh, our debt and deficits will impair economic growth for the next generation. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are appropriate in response to this crisis and not overspend, but effectively spend and, and make sure that we don't put, uh, 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 needlessly put people through additional pain. And that we get treatment resources online, that we get new testing online. Um, and those things uh, are, are highly important. And then as we reemerge, we need to make sure that we have a uh, deregulation agenda that lifts people into being able to use their money more effectively and, and some tax relief paired with that so you can get people back on their feet very quickly. Well, that's my question about tax relief, actually, because we're hearing out of the White House that what they'd like in a new package would include uh, payroll tax suspension or forgiveness and maybe even capital gains relief. Does that make sense if we're worried about the deficit that we're going to be cutting taxes at the same time? Don't we have to pay for this through increased taxes at some point? Yes, and, and that's why I think you have to have entitlement reform paired with, uh, paired with uh, uh, payroll tax relief uh, a bill. And I think we can marry those two things up so that we uh, we pare down our uh, our entitlement spending o over the next uh, 20, 30 years. And the pay for uh, and the trade off there was that, that, that you would get uh, uh, some tax relief in the short term for those that are most affected by the shutdown of our economy. I think that's a quite a good pairing. You actually have long term cuts in order to pay for uh, a short term uh, program. Can you have uh, something that's been talked about forever and nothing has been done about, that is to say entitlement re reform, at a time when some of the, the least fortunate among us are being hit the hardest by this pandemic? This is not the time necessarily to hit the social net, right? That, that's exactly right. I think you, you've hit it. Uh, I mean, th this is, we have a series of very complex decisions we have to make. The, the initial decision to, to shut down was a much clearer decision than what we're faced with coming out of this. What's the proper response with tax relief? What's the proper response for spending? Uh, how does that pair with our debt and deficit predictions? How does that match up with public safety and public health? And these things are quite complex uh, issues that we've got to struggle with um, and, uh, and work through on a bipartisan basis so we give the public some reassurance it's, it's safe and uh, to re-engage in the economy, and that our long-term finances are adept so you can invest in this country. Does a payroll tax cut make sense when it only goes to people who have jobs and the people we need to be taking care of are the ones who don't have jobs? Well, yeah, uh, well, it, it's tough to say that to the, the person who wants to get a job. Um, and so what I, what I see with the unemployment rate skyrocketing uh, most of these folks uh, were employed before. They, uh, they want to work. They want to provide value. They, it is a meaningful part of their life. And so uh, what I would say is uh, it, that payroll tax relief is about getting people back into the economy uh, and off of unemployment insurance um, and back into reengaging to grow this economy back out. And I think that would be a nice incentive for people to be able to get back into working and off the uh, more generous, um, the more generous uh, unemployment benefits that were part of the last CARES package. Okay, Congressman, really appreciate your time today. You were very generous with us. That's Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican of North Carolina. Coming up here, we're going to talk with a patient's right advocate. She is Cynthia Fisher about exactly what reform of the healthcare system looks like during a pandemic. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, long before coronavirus was a household word, Cynthia Fisher and her organization, PatientRightAdvocate.org, were really advocating for health care reform, specifically in the area of transparency, uh, in terms of what the costs are for our health care. And now we welcome Cynthia Fisher to Bloomberg. Thank you so much for being with us, ma'am. I guess my basic question is you were really an advocate. You were making a lot of progress, I think, actually, on really transparency in our medical bills. Does that survive a pandemic? Where are we now? Yes, uh, thank you, David. It's a great opportunity to be here today. Well, right now, we're looking in this pandemic of people needing to protect their physical, their mental health, but more importantly, even their financial health for, the, for their families. And price transparency, knowing the prices before we receive care is ever more important to give the consumer the ability to control uh, their costs and their coverage. So as we enter this pandemic, in this next round of stimulus money that Congress is looking to put in place, it is critical to protect the American consumer, patients, employers, and the taxpayers by insisting that health care price transparency is part of the COVID package. So, I mean, for most of us, and this was true long before the pandemic, we thought it makes some sense to kind of know what the charge is before you incur the charge. And as I say, there was real progress, I believe, being made in Congress on that subject. Where's the resistance? Yes, I think the resistance has been from the healthcare in, in industry itself. Uh, you know, hospitals and insurance companies have had secret negotiated prices. And uh, recently, in November of last year, the Trump administration put forth rules for hospitals and the insurers to actually show their cash and their negotiated rates before we receive care. And, you know, Ultimately, the Trump administration and Nancy Pelosi agree on the same things. That is, as we go toward this next COVID package, they want Nancy Pelosi uh, called out for more accountability and more transparency. And here, the Trump administration has already implemented these rules. So as we go forward, uh, it's really embraced by consumers. And in fact, David, in the Harvard-Harris poll, 88% of all Americans actually supported, strongly supported the government mandates for hospitals and insurance companies to reveal their prices before we get care. Post it online. Is, is there a basic, uh, there's a basic fairness, basically, in knowing what the price is before you have to pay it. No question about it. You also hope that it will help that it will bend the cost curve for healthcare because I think one of the things that may come out of this pandemic is a clamor for broader coverage. Yes, well, you know, as we look at um, this pandemic and what the experience has been for families trying to protect the very savings that they have and not sure of their next paycheck, um, we've seen variance in pricing from. $75 for COVID testing to as high as $6,000. So having been uh, blindsided by a $6,000 bill after the fact, when they could have gone to a direct primary care physician for $75, having that kind of choice allows the American patient and worker, and even employer for that matter, to keep those types of funds uh, in their pocket. And when, when, we be able, when we can see prices, uh, we know that we'll be able to drive down the cost of care and coverage. And you mentioned how. Well, a, a Journal of American Medical Association last year said that 25% of our billing charges are administrative waste. You could imagine if we can see prices, we could just cut to the quick and we would eliminate that 25%. Then add on to that any kind of fraud or price gouging. Um, when prices are seen, the consumer in control, yes, we will see a reduction in the cost of care and ultimately downstream the cost of coverage as well. So, so Cynthia, are you pretty optimistic that you will actually get this disclosure of prices, this transparency, as you call it, in round four, as it's called, of the stimulus? Well, you know, I, I, I am optimistic because, you know, I think the Congress leadership, um, McConnell, uh, we've got Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the president himself, we're looking across uh, our country 
And people now more than ever are needing to protect not only their health, but their wealth. And as we go into this, the trillion-dollar stimulus that uh, Nancy Pelosi just is coming together with the Democrats on the House side to, to propose, wanting accountability and transparency, there is an answer. And that is to simply codify these rules. They've already been baked, David. In fact, 23,000 Americans reported in overwhelmingly in support, telling their own stories about how they were surprised or blindsided by medical bills they couldn't afford and never knew they had to pay. So they weighed in in strong support. And I think it's time now for Congress to really listen to its constituents versus the lawyers and lobbyists that had previously lined the halls, but are at least lining their telephone and, and, and their Skype right now. But I would encourage any American consumer to... Uh, reach out to their congressmen and, and women yeah. in this moment of time to say how important it yeah. is for them to have price transparency yeah. in the next Cynthia, Thank you so much for being with us. Really important to cover. That's Cynthia Fisher. She's patientrightsadvocate.org. She's the chairman there. In the meantime, coming up in the second hour of Balance of Power, we're going to talk with the man who runs the hospital system that first had to treat COVID-19 present patients. That is Dr. Rod Hockman. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Bloomberg Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The airline industry all around the world is being hurt badly. The IAG say, says it could take to 2024 before it recovers. And that certainly includes Europe. Uh, with a, a Spanish economy minister, she is Nadia Calvino, spoke exclusively to Bloomberg Television earlier today about exactly what the extreme measures are that they're willing to take to help save the industry. The airlines were in a different uh, health situation before the crisis broke. Uh, we see that some airlines were already in a tricky financial situation. Other, others had a, a more robust balance sheet, and so they may require different kinds of support. We are strongly supporting that there's a European response. All these large carriers are not of uh, one national or another, they are European carriers. And that's why we're strongly uh, defending that we would provide a level playing field and the different sorts of support uh, provide a similar uh, level of, of um, funding and similar level of credibility and strength to the different operators so that we do not create uh, competition problems. Actually, European countries are in different boats. A, in terms of fiscal responsibility, some countries like Germany have just been historically better at dealing with finances than countries like Italy and Spain. I mean, um, you already had a big debt before we came into this. And B, uh, countries like Germany don't have the kind of social safety net. For example, here, uh, when you're out of work, you get paid 65% of your salary. And there, I think it's closer to 80%, right? So shouldn't money that essentially uh, Germany is lending to Spain and Italy be uh, attached with some conditions? Well, insofar as the safety net is concerned, I'm afraid that Germany has a much stronger safety net than we do. Every year we get recommendations from the European Commission, from other international institutions saying we should reinforce our redistributive systems. Uh, unfortunately, they are not the strongest part that we have in our country. But you're right that in the previous years we have made a huge effort to reduce our debt to GDP le levels. Um, I was actually quite satisfied that in the last year we had been able to go down very significantly down to 95.5%. And unfortunately, this year, we expect this ratio to go up to around 115%. This is a temporary uh, exception, if you wish, of a downward uh, trend, which I hope we will be able to resume uh, as soon as recovery is stronger. But for the moment, all countries are going to be faced with the same trouble, which is we cannot put health and the economy on different uh, plates. We need to get out of the health crisis as soon as possible if we want the economy to recover as strongly as possible. Minister, and to do that, will you borrow from the ESM? Changes have been made to it to make it more favourable to borrow there uh, during this coronavirus. So will you borrow from the ESM? I think it's very good that we have been able to reach an agreement on three different funding tools, which are based on loans. These are not grants or transfers. These are 
loans to the countries. One is the ESM, as you pointed out, a pandemic precautionary line. Secondly, the a new instrument called SURE that would reinforce short-term work screen, st schemes like the ones that we have enacted in, in Spain in particular. And thirdly, the EIB to provide uh, common guarantees. We're strongly supporting these three instruments. We think it's good that all member states could have access to additional funding sources. But for the moment, uh, our funding conditions are very, very favorable. Uh, in the last auctions we have done, our T-bills, 12-month 12, 12 T-bills have gone into the negative area again. We have been able to get very good conditions and therefore we do not have any problem with tapping financial markets. Still, I think it's good that there's a safety net for citizens, for companies and for governments at the European level, which uh, provides an additional reinforcement element for us to face this pandemic. That was Spain's economy minister. She's Nadia Calvino. She spoke earlier to Bloomberg Television. Coming up on the second hour of Balance of Power, we're going to be talking with Dr. Rod Hockman. He is the Providence St. Joseph Health president and CEO. One of his hospitals was the first one to treat a COVID-19 patient in the United States. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.